Greetings, folks. Phil Gallagher of Thraben U here for a special piece of legacy content. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a couple of DNT matches from the top eight of the showcase challenge this weekend, which was taken down by DNT. Moto Grinder Aaron Relentless has been crushing events for a very long time. The thing that I want to highlight here is not necessarily just DNT results. But the range of results that this player has. Um, you see this at the bottom? That's 11 pages of results. They put the effort to really show up to and play in a, a lot of tournaments, and they have had success over time with a ton of archetypes. Um, this player is no stranger to death and taxes, and uh, I know they've supported my stream many times in the past. And now I'm very happy to have the opportunity to walk through some of their matches. Uh, so you can follow them on Twitter at Aaron underscore Relentless if you want to hear more cool things from them and see some of their results. Um, they had a great, great run. And this is the decklist that he played. So let's see if I can zoom in on this just a touch for you all. That made it worse. Okay, uh, this deck list, and apologies for it being a little smaller than normal, uh, is geared a little bit towards taking on things like Rug Delver. There is a relatively large amount of removal here. Uh, and as a whole, I think I like this deck list quite a bit. Uh, a lot of the elements are stock. Of note, there is a Flagstones in the main deck to supplement two Cataclysms in the sideboard, and that's something that has fallen a little bit out of favor recently and become less popular, um, but he brought it back for this event. The main deck has three Spirit of the Labyrinths in the flex slots, which I think is a very, very good choice, and they have chosen to play two Silent Clearings, which is something that I'm going to focus on a lot in this league. Silent Clearing is a card that is simultaneously both amazing and awful. The life loss is sometimes literally the deal breaker between you winning and losing a game, and every non-basic land that you add to the deck makes you more susceptible to things like Wasteland. Yet at the same time, you cannot dismiss the ability to turn a land into a card draw spell over the course of the league, and we're going to see in a couple of matches today just how good uh, Silent Clearing can be, as well as the impact that the life total change can have on a game. So uh, they beat Astrolabe Control, Rug Delver, Rug Delver, Rainbow Depths, Elves. Um, there aren't numbers here. Oh, I see. Uh, lost to Anzi Pile, beat Anzi Pile, lost to Rug Delver, beat Rug Delver, beat a Rug Midrange deck, and then beat Rug Delver to take down this event. So they had a very, very impressive run. So what I'm going to do is do commentary for their top eight matches. I'm going to take two matches versus Rug Delver and one deck versus a Rug Midrange deck, um, such as Pokey Pile. And we're going to see how this player has chosen to play them and highlight some of the really great decisions that they made, as well as take a couple of opportunities to really do a deep dive on some of these situations. If you are excited about this content and want to see more legacy slash DNT content in the future, please consider liking or subscribing to the channel. It means a lot. Let's hop right into it. Okay, JK, before we get started, here's a slightly zoomed in view of the deck list. Uh, a couple of the names are cut off here at the bottom, but they're just more copies of what's already here. So hopefully uh, this is a little bit more readable for you all. Okay. So this is the quarterfinals match versus Kentaro Hikori on Rug Delver. Now, there are plenty of people saying that this matchup is hard for DNT, but I don't actually think that's true. I think the Rug Delver matchup is extremely good, and this is something that changed after the printing of Skyclave Apparition. Um, I've heard that, uh, that Eitai, aka Iyati, is on something crazy like a 20-0 heater versus Delver, and that's not overly surprising to me. So let's see how these matches play out in practice. In my experience, most of the time where the Rug Delver player doesn't have an unchecked Arcanist that just takes over the game, Death and Taxes usually wins the games pretty handily. So I'm going to be watching a Moto replay here and doing my commentary on that. 
So I don't have full control over looking at all of the zones and everything of that nature. I'm going to be watching this MTGO replay at 0.7 speed because I found it a little nauseating to try and do commentary on it at full speed. All right, here we go. So this is a solid opening hand that has good tools for the Rug Delver matchup if Aaron knows that the opponent is on that. Otherwise, this is a fine hand that has a decent number of tools. And versus a just snow-covered island in the dark, jamming a Stoneforge Mystic is probably fine. If this spell gets dazed here, the opponent can't go and do something like play a Dread Horde Arcanist or Sylvan Library or something of that nature on turn two. And now this plan can be repeated this turn cycle, playing around a daze this time, while also leaving open a Wasteland. And since he has four lands and can pretty easily go Jitte Equip, picking up that card makes a lot of sense here over something like a Batter Skull. The opponent hasn't had the opportunity to use a Lightning Bolt yet, so getting a Batter Skull and getting that stuck in hand would be pretty awful. All right, I'm going to pause at this point because this turn is, is really cool. So this is something that pretty commonly happens with death and taxes, where you have the ability to double spell in a turn, but you can do it in a way that forces one of your spells to be utterly uncounterable. So he casts Thalia here. And if this Thalia gets countered by a force of will, he then gets to go Snug Covered Plains and Source of Plowshares, this young Pyromancer. And if this Thalia doesn't get countered by a Force of Will, then Thalia resolves and Swords to Plowshares becomes uncounterable due to the Thalia attacks. So this is really tight and good sequencing. Sometimes I see newer Death and Taxes players go and just cast a Source of Plowshares on a creature before they do anything else with their turn because they want to play around the most stuff. But in reality, this is the line that plays around the most stuff. And look at the reward for doing this. We do see a Force of Will on Thalia. And now the land drop means that this Source to Plowshares is incredibly likely to resolve. Uh, because it's no longer getting dazed. And the opponent has used a Force of Will already to take care of the Thalia. Now if we like look at the relative board positions of these two players... The Death and Taxes player is currently ahead. But the worst possible thing has happened, the opponent has had Oko. And unchecked Oko or Arcanist, that's how you go and win these games. So the, the answer needs to be tutored up right now before this Oko runs away with the game. And this is Skyclave's Apparition's job. You follow up with Mother of Runes to efficiently use your mana. And this is probably past the point in the game where you need to be scared about a Mother of Runes getting dazed. If it gets dazed, it gets dazed. If it doesn't, it's awesome. All right, so let's talk about that real quick. So the opponent is now going to have an active Mother of Runes, and that's something that's really, really scary uh, because Dreadhorde Arcanist plus protection is a way to very, very handily lose games. And this is something that a Rug Delver deck is normally not allowed to have. And I think this was a really good swap by the opponent, and I don't think Oko's swap mode is utilized enough. Uh, this served as a very strong removal spell. All right, so now he has the option to Skyclave this mom, but that's not really the problem card. And the reason it's not the problem card is because Umazawa's Jitte in hand, plus some sort of flyer or some other sort of evasion that can actually punch through and connect, can answer Mother of Runes as well as this elemental token simultaneously. So something like a Flicker Wisp a little bit later means that this isn't a problem. Whereas Oko hitting play and staying unchecked for a few turns ends the game. This is the sort of scenario where if the opponent had a Daze or Force of Will there, the game is very likely over. But now Death and Taxes has pulled very far ahead. Mana is a bit of a choke point right now, but that has been solved by this draw step. Now Spear of the Labyrinth cuts off opposing cantrips, and even though there's going to be a staring match for a little while, this is a staring match that is unquestionably going to be favoring Death and Taxes. 
The opponent's cantrips are off. So, notably there, if the opponent has main deck Spell Pierce, by not playing the Wasteland prior to this, this card was opened up to a Spell Pierce. However, by not playing out the land first, there is sort of false information sent temporarily that the card that is in hand is not a land, because it would make sense if you had the land to play it out first. So that means that the final card could be something like a Source of Plowshares, that it might be more important to counter later. Um, interesting spot. So now this is a staring match in which the cantrips have been shut off by Spear of the Labyrinth, and there's now a very good piece of equipment in play. Uh, he'll be looking for a flyer to hopefully go and finish this game off. And here we run into Silent Clearing for the first time. Now, Silent Clearing on this board is a little bit more interesting than normal because of the presence of Spirit of the Labyrinth, which there are three of in this deck. So on his own turn, Silent Clearing can't actually cycle. So he can't just drop this and cycle this immediately in order to pick up a card, but it can be cycled on the opposing, opponent, opponent's turn, so it's not dead. Alright, so here we see an equip to a creature. Doing it on Skyclave Apparition seems fine. Uh, Recruiter of the Guard is somewhat likely to be blinked by a Flicker Wisp later. And if one of these creatures is going to die, it's probably preferable that it's the Skyclave Apparition. So now we're probably seeing the Silent Clearing cycle, and hey, wouldn't you know it, it's probably the best possible draw on this board. It's the thing that is going to break this game open, Flicker Wisp. So from the board state right now, we expect the Illusion Token to attack in on the following turn cycle. And that means that Recruiter of the Guard can just block this card, and we do see that. And this vial can be activated, blinking the recruiter of the guard, and then netting another card in the process. And this is very, very strong. All right, we now see a spooky card hitting the other side of the battlefield. And now, a game for our viewers at home. What do you get off the recruiter of the guard? You have tons of options available to you. What is the best line? I think a lot of people would go for Skyclave Apparition here. Because the thought of going and connecting with Flicker Wisp and then removing Mother of Runes with one token and then maybe shrinking Dreadheart Arcanus with another token is just like absolutely clutch. Let's see if that's what Aaron Relentless does. He got Flicker Wisp. Why would he do that? Okay, so what is the disaster level scenario for this turn cycle? The disaster level scenario is that the opponent has a lightning bolt. And that lightning bolt gets aimed at this Flicker Wisp. And then Jitte doesn't successfully connect in this turn cycle. And if that happens... This Dreadheart Arcanus might get to attack, might get to start Lightning Bolt down the board, and then it's protected with Mother of Runes as well, and the game might just end on the spot. So picking up the Flicker Wisp here is super clutch. And wouldn't you know it, he avoided the disaster level scenario with very, very tight play. Alright, so now we see the Flicker Wisp. We can go ahead and take out one land. And now this Flicker Wisp can kind of just chill for a turn. There is probably a misplay in this turn cycle, though. So, these creatures aren't going to attack with Jitte, right? But you know that there's nothing... Your opponent knows that you have Flicker Wisp in hand as your final card, and there's nothing else that you can do with this mana. So one of these two creatures should probably get suited up with the Jitte. Is, is that going to matter? No, not in this turn cycle. 
But what if things get a little bit weird and things don't go according to plan? Then it might matter that you used this, this mana effectively. So here's a fun little dance. So the opponent attacks and they grab a lightning bolt and they point it at Spirit of the Labyrinth. And this forces the Flicker Wisp to save that Spirit of the Labyrinth rather than get another card off of Recruiter of the Guard. So while it like kind of looks like the opponent got no value off of the Arcanist, they kept another Flicker Wisp from hitting play. And this is the turn cycle where if everything works out and the Flicker Wisp actually connects, that this game is likely over. All right, and we do indeed see that happening. So now the, the sequencing here is good. So prior to making any decisions, he confirms that his Mother of Runes is going to go and actually hit play. And this is good. Now, is the opposing Mother of Runes going to die 100% this turn? Yes, absolutely. But gaining that extra information first is always nice. When you can, make as many of your decisions as possible with the maximum amount of information. Okay, and we see a concession here from the opponent. Just to talk about this, if this turn cycle had proceeded a touch further, and we're about to go to combat, it's likely that he would have used one Jitte counter to keep Dreadhorde Arcanist from flashing back any of this stuff. Keeping this Mother of Runes alive for a single turn cycle probably ends the game in a slightly different way. We do not get to see how he sideboarded. But I can probably tell you that the couple of extra removal spells that are in the sideboard come in. We see a quick mulligan of a hand that has no white sources, which makes a lot of sense. And this is kind of what I think of as a, like, rug killer hand. You just have a giant pile of removal. And here we see a, an, a very active decision about when to cast swords to plowshares. So you might go, well, why not on your turn? And the answer is Force of Negation. So Force of Negation, while a two-for-one, is something that could guarantee counter that on his turn, but not on his opponent's turn. And that's why he's chosen to play around this in that way. So does this play into Spell Pierce? Yes. Does it play into a Brainstorm? Into Daze? Yes. But overall, I like this decision, especially when there's two more removal spells coming down the pipe in a little bit. The early Delver is not super threatening, and so again we see him playing around Force of Negation actively. And notably, we see the opponent choosing not to Wasteland. And this is why. The presence of an Ancient Grudge. So this game is going to get slowed down a little bit, and we're going to see some trading of resources for a little while. All right, uh, so let's talk about that play right there. So here he opted to Brashadden Port rather than Wasteland and destroy that land. The more lands that you have in play versus Delver, the greater ability you have to play around soft permission like Dagis and Spell Pierce. So in a turn cycle where he really wasn't doing anything else, it could be totally reasonable to see if you can keep your lands in play while also disrupting your opponent. Because there are some games where working towards hard casting something like a Batter Skull can be extremely important to ending the game. And specifically, with an Umazawa's Jitte in hand, you, you really would like to have around 4 mana total to just kind of make it so that you can play a threat, port your opponent, and then go Jitte and equip in the same turn cycle. And now that he's made another land drop, it's fine to just wasteland the opponent, take them off of days, bring them down to zero lands, and try to leverage advantage in that way. We're going to see a little bit of draw go here. And this is a turn cycle where you kind of have to ask yourself, do I cycle this silent clearing? 
Cycling the Silent Clearing takes you off of casting three drops, which is kind of a big deal, especially when your three drop answer to Oko is in hand. But cycling towards finding, say, a Stoneforge Mystic or a Thalia that might have a high impact on this board is totally valid as well. I think I might have sat on that Silent Clearing for another turn before making that decision, but I don't think it is wrong by any stretch of the imagination to cycle there. So this is very similar to the spot from before, where he's going to have to make a decision about whether or not to cycle that Silent Clearing. And now, with two three drops in hand, I think it makes more sense to just chill. And you really don't want to play Skyclave Apparition as just a 2-2 beater. That does not make a lot of sense in this matchup. The way that you lose to Rugged Alvarez Death and Taxes is by going and having one of their unchecked Snowball Haymaker cards carry the game away. All right, so we're going to continue to see draw go, but this right here is why I'm not too worried about Rug Delver whenever I'm playing Death and Taxes. Yes, you can have the games where they spiral out of control with turn 2 Dreadhorde Arcanist, but right now it's turn 12 and the Death and Taxes player has five removal spells in hand. Like, good luck, Rug Delver. This is a relatively strong turn cycle for the opponent, although I do slightly wonder what caused them to ponder after all the other things. Alright, so Skyclave Apparition resolves, takes down Oko, which is fantastic. And notice that there is not a decision to Wasteland here. And this is because Playing three drops around days is pretty much more important than anything else right now. Another Oko or another Arcanist sticking is, is basically the only thing that is super, super spooky right now. The 3-3 three, three token in play is not terrifying. It's relevant, but with so much removal spell and then also some life gain here, it's not the end of the world. And here we see a super heads-up play. So the opponent wastelanded the wasteland. And the level 1 obvious play is, well, I'll wasteland you back. Then your wasteland does nothing. But if the opponent is wastelanding there, what does it make sense for them to have? And the answer is days. So he has chosen to float the mana here. And that means that this Flicker Wisp is played around days. Now, if the opponent doesn't have days, this is a brilliant play because it allows them to go and not get wastelanded by a wasteland and essentially take that card out for free. And that's super valuable. But if they do have the days, playing around it here is beyond clutch. So now for the first time, the DNT player has a threat that has untapped onto an empty board. There's a whole bunch of removal spells in the tank, as well as some life gain. This is a great position. So both of the opponent's basic lands are in play already, so this is relatively safe. Now, notice the read here. So on the previous turn, he got the read that the Rugged Elver player has days in hand. So he does not just jam Stoneforge Mystic into the known days. Could you just use that to get it out of the hand? Yeah, sure. But you're hoping to just ignore that card for the rest of the game. And it's totally fine to just throw a card at that come the end step. And now he has the opportunity to play a Stoneforge Mystic and fetch up a new piece of equipment. Notably, there is still an Ancient Grudge in the graveyard. So this piece of equipment is not really going to do anything unless that second tropical island can be taken care of. Alternatively, at 5 mana, 
this starts to become a non-problem. Now, there is a possible decision point this turn. Leaving up Batter Skull being put in off Stoneforge Mystic essentially means you need to leave open this green mana or I deal 4 damage to you and gain 4 life. And then I'll be able to hold up 3 mana for Batter Skull for most of the rest of the game. So there is something threatened by this Stoneforge Mystic attack. At the same time, it's also probably reasonable to just send in the Stoneforge Mystic and do some chip damage here because the opponent is incredibly likely to leave up Ancient Grudge in this turn cycle, so you don't really get much out of leaving the Stoneforge up here. That said, I probably pass with Batter Skull up as well. But I wanted to talk about that because that's something that I, I had been thinking about. Mother of Runes is an excellent, excellent draw here. The ability to keep this Stoneforge safe is very nice, and future draws like Spirit of the Labyrinth are gas. Alright, now, that Rough Tumble was known from the Delver flip on, I believe, turn 1 or turn 2 of this game. And so it finally, finally, finally came back around. If you are not in the habit of writing down what cards your opponent has in Paper Magic, this is a great example. Because this is information from turn 1 coming back and being relevant on turn 18. No exaggeration. So again, this Ancient Grudge is still in the graveyard, so until that happens, Batter Skull is uh, is is a no go. It, it doesn't have relevant text. So here we will just remove that card before it can spiral out of control. There's some argument to try and just use Skyclave Apparition to answer that instead, but you don't really want your opponent to have the opportunity to remove the Skyclave Apparition and end up with a token that can clock you. Um, leaving the Skyclave, Skyclave Apparition in hand for as long as possible also helps you to play around yet another Oko that would hit play. So this is a nice heads-up play. He gets to eliminate the value of that food token so that a future Uro, or sorry, a future Oko is slightly less relevant, and that's pretty strong. Alright, so we see another Dreadhorde Arcanist. And that's not that big of a deal. So the question here is, what exactly do you do in this turn cycle? Because there are options. This is a point where you might want to consider using the Skyclave Apparition, but the Path to Exile is also totally reasonable as well. The reason to use the Skyclave Apparition is to try to increase your clock as much as possible, because... There is a very active difference in damage between one Flicker Wisp attacking and one Flicker Wisp and a Skyclave attacking. Like, five versus three is incredibly relevant here. And now the opponent doesn't have any green. The coast is clear for Batter Skull, but I do like playing Spirit of the Labyrinth first. It's just very strong to cut off cantrips when the game is this far gone. So now we see an attack for 8, which is potentially a lethal attack. Oh wait, we don't see that. Why not? This is avoiding the worst case scenario once again, and I really want to praise Aaron Relentless for this play. So, what happens if the opponent has Lightning Bolt and all of these creatures attack him? Lightning Bolt kills Skyclave Apparition, which gives the opponent a 2-2, which gets rid of Spirit of the Labyrinth. So that would mean that opponent gets a two for one while they are absolutely on the ropes if they have Lightning Bolt here. So while you can put that to the test and just say, well, if they have it, they have it, you're about to deploy a Batter Skull and you're very far ahead on board and cantrips are dead. Avoid the worst case scenario line and try to lock up the win. I think this attack is very, very good. Oh my gosh, what would have happened if we attacked with all of the creatures? 
the worst case scenario would have happened. So that's twice in this game that Aaron Relentless successfully avoided the worst case scenarios by playing around them in advance. And this is this is what you want to be doing if if you're looking to make the top eight and maybe even win one of these showcase challenges. You need to be thinking about what is the worst thing that can happen to me? How do I avoid it? What can my opponent do to get back into this game? How can I avoid it? And that's exactly what they did here. Our second match here is versus Rug Midrange, and by that I believe he means Pokey Pile, which is essentially a sort of deck somewhere between Delver and Snow. It plays a little bit more controlling game and doesn't have Delvers, but it still has Stifles, which it often uses as more of a utility thing instead of a mana denial thing. Let's see how this match plays out. Okay, so the opening hand here is fine, but this is a an opening hand that is going to start with Silent Clearing. And Silent Clearing in the opening hand is going to deal him a decent amount of damage, because Death and Taxes doesn't really get away with not tapping its lands on most turns. This is a very strong opener. Like, when you have Thalia on the play, that is just fantastic. And now, he can go ahead and play a Stoneforge Mystic around a Daze effect here. And then Wasteland the Red Source so the Stoneforge Mystic is more likely to survive and dump this Batter Skull in play. Opponent will be brainstorming, looking for maybe like Fetchland plus a Lightning Bolt effect, and they indeed do find it. But he gets to run back this plan yet again. Silent Clearing has now done a Lightning Bolt worth of damage. So now we see something very scary happening, and that's Oko hitting play. Oko is under a fair amount of pressure, but this is an awesome tempo play. Or at least it would have been. So the Flicker Wisp theoretically would have been able to go and blink the Stoneforge Mystic and find the final piece of equipment, or alternatively, hit the food so that Oko can't plus and make an elk in this turn cycle. All right, and this is the moment where you probably get to figure out that your opponent is not playing Rug Delver and instead is playing Pokey Pile. The presence of Mystic Sanctuary shows that the opponent is playing a deck that is going to be a little more on the controlling axis rather than on the aggressive axis. All right. So we get to take one more shot at Oko here, but we don't get to bring it down to one loyalty. And now, once again, we see the sequencing of where Thalia comes first before anything else. Silent Clearing is up to a Lava Axe worth of damage. The food token does a little dance before deciding to get in there. And... His life total is under real duress at this point from this Silent Clearing, which has now done 6 damage. Uh-huh, what's a 6 damage burn spell? Thunderous Wrath is still 5? Yeah, tough. Alright. So this is getting to be about the point where this Oko is in serious threat of just winning this game. The damage combination from Silent Clearing plus an elk or two is starting to be pretty spooky. Batter Skull ended up being a very expensive 3-3. And the damage was just taken here. Source to Plowshares was played around a soft permission spell like Spell Pierce. Unfortunately there was a force of will for it. So we are going to see a Batter Skull attack here. It went directly at the opponent, and the Sword Trigger is instead going and shooting Oko. And this allows for a card draw. Silent Clearing has now done, I believe, 8 damage. And necessitates a Chump Block with a Mother of Runes. 
All right. The Oko is killed in this turn cycle. And the Silent Clearing is finally cycled. There's a lot of incoming damage here, but notice there's not an all-out attack. The all-out attack probably is a little bit too risky since he is at 3 life. But this is a pretty brutal draw that allows the attack for 9 to be performed this turn, which should lock up the game. Okay, so now now we ask the question. Was was Silent Clearing good or was Silent Clearing bad that game? Silent Clearing did a crap ton of damage, but Silent Clearing also drew towards that very, very relevant Flicker Wisp towards the end of the game. Silent Clearing is not a card that is clear-cut good or bad. When you put that card in your deck, you're actively making a decision. Now, imagine that the opponent was not playing Poke Pile, and they instead were just playing, say, Rug Delver. What if the opponent had a Delver at some point in this game? Almost all of this damage was inflicted by Silent Clearing. It was Silent Clearing and one other threat. If the opponent had a second threat, all of a sudden that Silent Clearing might have lost them the game. And this is one of the reasons why I'm often so conservative in building my mana bases. I really like the power of basic lands. Silent Clearing is not a bad card, but when you play it, you really need to recognize what it does. And an opener where Silent Clearing is your only mana source, your only white mana source, is really a big deal. And that's what this game showcases really well. So again, we aren't going to get to see sideboarding, but we should expect things uh, like Rest in Peace to be coming in to help deal with uh, Dreadhorde Arcanist and Oko. Sorry, and Uro. Ah, hey, it's our friend, Silent Clearing, once again. And starting with this with a hand with five white spells is a little bit rough. So, in this turn cycle, there is an alternate timeline in which you wasteland again. But if you Wasteland again right here, you're going to lose the opportunity to play all of these cards around days, and you're also going to lose the opportunity to play the Thalia next turn, or to work towards things like Stoneforge Mystic and Recruiter that might be coming a little bit further down the line. So if you want to try and be playing the short game, you can choose to just Wasteland here. But your opponent has cantrips to help them find their lands, and you have excellent, excellent cards that probably win you the game if you cast them, so I, th I think it is totally reasonable to not waste land here. The awkward thing, though, is if the opponent has a waste land of their own in this turn cycle, and this Silent Clearing just gets wasted, and then they play a Delver or something like that as a follow-up, then that game probably ends immediately. Luckily, that doesn't happen. And these Delver openings that just begin with a pile of cantrips are usually some of the easier ones to go and beat. Alright, Athalia has hit play, and this means that the Oko hitting play on turn 3 is not something that can happen. Athalia is just removed immediately. So here we see Rest in Peace, and this resolving is a pretty big deal. This means that we're not going to have to worry about a lot of spells from here on out. Now, this is a decision that I don't know if I agree with. He has chosen to not Wasteland here. And when I'm looking at this hand, I'm, I'm thinking that I need to get to another white source so that I have answers to Oko. And if I drag this game on to the point where I have another Wasteland, I probably go and win this. Because there, there's two cards that you care about in this matchup, right? One is Dreadhorde Arcanist, which has been neutered, and two is Oko. So I don't know that I like leaving this opponent with Volcanic Island here. 
Because if you Wasteland, you take off the possibility of them casting Oko in this turn cycle. Which is indeed <laughs> what ends up happening. And this is terrifying. If a white source isn't drawn soon, this game is probably in dire straits. Wilt is very strong from the opponent here. It's going to turn things like Dreadhorde Arcanist back on. And seeing as he has three sorts of plowshares, using one on a food token is totally reasonable. And just like that, the game has gotten to a terrifying position again. Dreadhorde Arcanist is more likely to spiral out of control quickly than Oko is. Though Oko can sit on the board for a turn and just make a food in this turn cycle before going for a Skyclave Apparition or Council's Judgment. That all makes a lot of sense to me. I like going for Skyclave Apparition here over Council's Judgment. You might think that you want to use the Council's Judgment first because like, it just cleanly exiles the Oko and you don't have to worry about giving them a token-based threat later on that they can win the game with. But in reality, playing the Council of Judgment means that you play into Force of Negation, which is not great. Now, notably, remember how I talked about the Wasteland play a little bit earlier? Notice that the opponent did Force of Will pitching a Daze here. So in the timeline where I might have Wastelanded Volcanic Island, this spell, you know, maybe in this turn cycle, maybe in a different turn cycle, is going to get countered. So notice the choice not to use Wasteland here. That's to play these around future dazes. All right, and things have gotten spooky. Now a white source has been destroyed with the opposing Wasteland here which means that something like double spelling to get rid of both Arcanist and Oko in the same turn cycle is not valid. So again, this is taking out the problematic card that spirals more quickly. Dreadhorde Arcanist is something that I often think loses the game in, or sorry, wins the game in a single untap step versus death and taxes. That's not surprising here. Um, notably, the opponent here has an Oko with approximately a bajillion D loyalty. So while the mom is still summoning sick, a line they could have taken was a swap. They could have swapped their 3-3 elk for an active mother of runes. And that's something that could be a little bit spooky. It's hard to know whether or not that's something that's correct without like knowing the, the contents of their hand. Um, but that was something I was thinking about when I watched this. All right, now we finally, after many turn cycles, see this uh, sorry, see so we see the Oko leave play. Things are not necessarily okay yet, though. So there's one, two, three, four cards remaining or this Uro in the graveyard. And there's this Wasteland here. So were you supposed to use the Wasteland on your turn? That's a good question. If you Wasteland off of one of the colors, like say you Wasteland the Trap, it becomes much harder to actually bring back that Uro. But the secondary question is, like, does it matter if the Uro comes back, or is the plan just to cast Path to Exile on that, and you would rather have an extra land in play in order to play around a daze on a Skyclave Apparition that hits another Oko. See the, uh, the difficulty of playing this deck? There's a lot of decisions that are super small, and it's not just always like, hey, I should be pointing the Wasteland at this land. Sometimes the decisions are much, much more nuanced then they might appear at a glance. And if his plan is, I am going to let that card resolve, and then I am going to path to exile it, using the wasteland to answer it as well doesn't actually make that much sense.
The trade here makes a lot of sense, since he is at 10 life. And we see a Cycled Wilt. So, this Cycled Wilt now means that the Uro coming back is on the table for the next turn cycle. But he is just opting to put the Sword of Fire and Ice into play and allow the Uro to hit play. This allows a card to be drawn and a 6-6 six, six placed in play. The double spelling is not on the table here, unfortunately, and one of the opponent's remaining cards was a Force of Will. That means that this thing is going to deal about half of his life total in a single hit. And this is super unfortunate, but there is the follow-up counterspell as well. So, the plan to answer Uro with the two different answers to Uro in hand, rather than use the Wasteland, did not work out. Does that mean it was wrong? Ah, hard to say. But there were alternate lines available in this game. The Force of Will did pitch a Stifle, so it's possible that going after the Tropical Island doesn't actually end up doing what he might have wanted it to do if that was a line that he chose instead. Whew. Magic is great. So that means we need to go to a game three. Let's see what the opening hand looks like. The opening hand here is pretty strong. It has a lot of, man of, of mana, but three of these things are essentially spell lands. And that forgives there being just a little bit too much mana here. We see the Stoneforge Mystic played on curve into a Batter Skull. Now, Batter Skull is maybe not great in a vacuum here because Lightning Bolt is something that you can really expect the opponent to have. But with so much mana available, working towards hard casting a Batter Skull is totally reasonable. Okay, so there. Maybe I should rewind this just a touch. Okay, so Flickerwist is the draw for turn. There is a greedier line available where you cast the Flicker Wisp, you use the Flicker Wisp to blink the Wasteland, and then you use it to target Tropical Island, and you end up much further ahead on board. However, in this scenario, if things go wrong, the opponent has the opportunity to swing the game really hard. So let's say that you cast the Flicker Wisp, and then they just like fetch cast days, counter the Flicker Wisp, and then slam an Oko into play, that game is probably over. Like, that—that that is it. You don't have an answer to Oko. You can source the Plowshares the first food, but then, like, your Batter Skull becomes an Elk, and, and you don't have a plan anymore. So I really like the conservative play here of just Wastelanding and just, just taking the time to drag out this game a little bit more. Notice that we are doing the Wastelanding in the opposing upkeep because the opposing deck does play Stifle. And so you don't want to give them that mana advantage by allowing them to spend that mana on your turn before they untap. So notice again, we're trying to keep the opponent from playing something that will impact the board strongly. And this is a turn cycle where we probably learn that they do not have an Oko in hand. This turn cycle is sort of interesting. So he has chosen not to use mana here. Now, why might that be? If you put the rest in peace into play when the opponent had, I think, three open mana, maybe four open mana, what can happen is that they just cast Wilt, and you don't really accomplish much by playing that rest in peace. So if you can get them to play out a Dreadhorde Arcanist first, for example, and then you can use that rest in peace to, you know, kind of answer that card, then you don't have to use your Swords of Plowshares to answer that card instead. And you can take a couple of pecks for, for one. The other thing that this does is if the opponent 
has, say, a daze, and you cast Rest in Peace. If they cast the daze, that means that they get all of their mana back on their turn. And while that might not be super relevant in this exact state, it's something that you maybe should be thinking about. I don't necessarily think it's horrible to play out the Rest in Peace there or anything, but waiting seems totally safe. There is only one thing to be thinking about, and that's Mystic Sanctuary. But that's a Mystic Sanctuary that just returned a Stifle, so that's not the end of the world. Alright. So now I think we see a Flicker Wisp, which will go and eat that food. And now you have to decide on the follow-up play. I really like Mother of Runes as the follow-up play. Alright, we now know that opponent has a Stifle in hand, so that's going to be something to keep in mind for the future. Alright, so this Flicker Wisp crashes in and starts to chip away at the loyalty of Oko, which at this point is pretty darn high. All right, so there's something very nuanced that happened in that turn cycle that is probably really easy to miss with how fast this video is going. So he played Silent Clearing and cracked Silent Clearing. Now, what does that signal to the opponent? That signals to the opponent, I am digging for an answer to your card. And Aaron Relentless knows that he has a Stifle in hand, right? So he is trying to get his opponent to use the Stifle on Silent Clearing so that Skyclave Apparition can resolve and exile Oko. This trick does not work, but this was a really good play. Alright, so opponent has a 3-3, which is not the end of the world. And you might ask yourself, why is the opponent choosing to attack here? This is probably the point where we want to be thinking about the clock. The opponent is down about five minutes on clock. They've started to turn into the red. And so they have chosen, like, I am going to start attacking with this food token, perhaps in respect of the fact that they need to end this game. The Death and Taxes player has five cards currently. And that means that physically ending the game within this time period might be a bit of a stretch. Alright, so we've seen a lot of things happen in this turn cycle that has resulted in the Death and Taxes player being in a pretty good position. However, not attacking the Oko does mean some spooky things. Alright, so Rest in Peace has shut off Dreadhorde Arcanist, and now we get to see if Skyclave Apparition can resolve in the same turn cycle and answer the Oko. Things are looking good. And this is where we start thinking about the clock again. Baku91 has now under 4 minutes of clock, a threat in play that doesn't necessarily do anything, and is getting double ported in every turn cycle. Oh, okay, we're, we're going to see a batter skull instead. That's reasonable. So in future turns, there's double Rashadon port in their future. And this is definitely a little bit spooky. This means that Uro is no longer a super relevant card. As well as, like, Dreadhorde Arcanist isn't. Ooh, and Spirit of the Labyrinth is a fantastic draw. Uh, okay. Notably, these theoretically could attack in. But once again, if both attack in and a lightning bolt happens, you lose both of them, so leaving these back is totally reasonable right now. Now we see Spirit of the Labyrinth, which shuts off cantrips, and hey, wouldn't you know it? It's that lightning bolt that he has now played around successfully um, in very important situations for the third time in two matches. Now, notice this turn, when the Lightning Bolt mana is not available, it is safer to make this attack.
Wilt has destroyed Batterskull. And again, no red mana available, so this attack is safe. And Rashadenport will do Rashadenport things. Sylvan Library is a little bit terrifying, though. And in the face of Sylvan Library, he is going ahead and attacking in. Um, I can't look at the zones to see how many volcanic islands have been taken away to know whether or not a fetchable one is available here. Um, but he probably had the read that either like you don't have Lightning Bolt or there's not another fetchable volcanic island left in deck. There also might not be any cards in hand, but I have the video paused right now, so I can't tell. So notice the play here of tapping down Misty Rainforest. That can be really important. It forces the opponent to pay life if they want to do that, and also makes cards like Ponder considerably worse for the rest of the turn cycle. The Death and Taxes player's position is starting to fade a little bit. The goal is in sight. However, the situations where the Death and Taxes player ends up losing are starting to compound greatly. One removal spell for the Skyclave Apparition that has the Oko under it totally spins this game. But look at the clock. The clock is starting to become a very, very, very real concern for Baku 91. So we see a removal spell for a Rest in Peace, which means that Dreadhorde Arcanist and Uro are live cards once again. This is starting to become a very spooky position. But unfortunately, Baku 91 doesn't have a castable spell in this turn cycle to flash back with Arcanist. And now, this is the turn where Baku has to draw something or they are dead. Oh, floating red mana. Do you have it? Okay, that is a blocker. That means that this is not the end of the world. Misty Rainforest fetch is reasonable. Is it Staticaster also means that these Skyclave Apparitions can no longer attack. Otherwise, Dreadheart Arcanus blocks one of them, dealing one damage to it. Is it Staticaster blocks the other? And then is it Staticaster blocks and shoots both of them? All of a sudden, the Death and Taxes player is not in a dominant position anymore. But Baku 91 has 20 seconds left on clock. And with quadruple Rashadenport available and wasting time for the opponent, Notice we lost two seconds to that port activation. Another two seconds to that one. They're just not going to be able to claw back into this game. So with infinite time, Baku 91 almost certainly gets the victory here. But you don't have infinite time on Magic Online. And playing a slower deck sometimes has real costs to it. And that's what we see here. We see a win via timeout, not a win via traditional means. Now, with Swords of Plowshares for the Dreadhorde Arcanus, so that doesn't get out of control, is this game actually in an okay position? The answer is, well, yeah, probably. You probably just get to Swords the Arcanus and attack in for lethal, but he doesn't even have to go for that line here and give the opponent more life to work with and, like, turn the fetch on again or anything like that. He can just take the win via time. And this is something that you should be thinking about when these games really drag on and on and on and on. Leveraging your, your time advantage and making fast plays when you can and only really stopping to tank when you need to is important. Especially because it's important to remember that this is coming at the end of a long day of, of magic, right? This is, this is not the beginning of this video. Uh, let me double check. How many Swiss rounds were there before this? So there were eight rounds of Swiss plus quarterfinals, and this is the semifinals match. So both players have played a lot of magic already. They're maybe not operating on their absolute prime. And when you slow down a little bit towards the end of the day, it's important to try and keep tabs on that. Let's take a look at the finals match now and see how that goes. Okay, and now here we are for the finals versus Samwise GG, uh, aka Jarvis Yu, who is a very powerful wizard. Jarvis is playing Rug Delver, and as we established in game one, the primary way for him to win is probably going to get be get an unchecked Dreadhorde Arcanist or an Oko into play ASAP. Let's see how these play out. 
Okay. We have an opening hand of Vile Vile, Port, Swords, Mom, Stoneforge, Skyclave Apparition. Do you keep it? And the answer is, yeah. Yeah, I keep that. The disaster case scenario here is that the first Aether Vial takes a Force of Will or Force of Negation, and then the Rashadden Port gets wastelanded. That's the scenario in which Aaron Relentless basically instantly loses the game on the spot. And so I could see some people shipping this hand. However, in the worlds where that doesn't happen, this hand is amazing. It is going to get to curve off of Vile, Mom into Stoneforge, into Skyclave Apparition, and also play a second Vile on turn two. So if the first one just gets countered and there's not a second Wasteland, you get to try again on turn two and still have that amazing Vile sequence available. I think this hand is certainly a keep, and let's see whether or not the disaster case scenario happens. All right, Jarvis leads on Valk Delver, which is a totally reasonable and strong opener. We see the second Aether Vial coming down here, but no ability to answer this Delver. Luckily, the Delver is a bit of a scumbag and doesn't naturally flip. So this brainstorm should go and set that up. Or not. Jarvis has instead opted to do something else. <clears throat> Let's see what that something else is. It is just a ponder. So what that tells us is that Jarvis's hand probably was weak in some regard. Maybe it has too much mana. Maybe he has something important for a little bit later on, like setting up a Dreadhorde Arcanist or putting back some lands or working towards an Oko that he is instead working to set up here. Note that Aaron Relentless has not decided to just like try and trade Mother of Runes for Delver, and seeing the cards that he has in hand, that makes perfect sense, right? Mom protecting Stoneforge or Mom protecting Spirit of the Labyrinth is probably a great way to go and win this game. So Jarvis has not left up the ability to Lightning Bolt a Mother of Runes. That means that like Mom has safely entered play, and things are probably going to start to look a little bit spooky. All right, we see another Spirit of the Labyrinth, which is pretty strong. Delver does not flip again, which is rough. Now second Delver has hit play, followed by a new Ponder. Uh-oh. It is Spirit of the Labyrinth time, which means that Jarvis does not get a card off of this Ponder. Wasteland on Rashadonport is not actually all that big of a deal. Skyclave Apparition can answer one of these Delvers once they flip. Alright, so there is a play being made here. Notice the, the stop that we have here. This is the upkeep. So he has decided to Stoneforge Mystic in the upkeep in order to take one piece of equipment out of the deck and very, very, very marginally improve the draw. Is this line good? I am not sure that this line is actually good. And the reason is because drawing a Thalia here could be a strong line. And why do I say could? Putting a Thalia into play puts a squeeze on your opponent's resources and makes it so harder for something like an Oko to hit play. But that would also mean that drawing something like land into Source to Plowshares is no longer on. So there is that to consider. I don't know if the hyper marginal reduction in draw quality or sorry, increase in draw quality is worth giving up the flexibility of drawing some other two drop and putting it into play. This also telegraphs to the opponent that you do have Stoneforge Mystic. And that's worth something, but your Stoneforge also probably isn't actually putting a card into play anytime soon here. 
So I don't know whether or not I like this line. I understand this line. Is this better than leaving up the possibility of like putting Anthalia and putting the squeeze on your opponent from yet another different direction? I don't know. The draw, luckily, was one that just allowed utter domination of this game. Getting a removal spell, or sorry, getting the land to cast the removal spell there is just so, so powerful. Okay, uh, yet again we see another pretty strong opening hand. This is just a hand that's stable. It can play three basic lands in a row. It has Rashadenport if it needs to deny the opponent some mana. Like, this is this is just good, solid, solid stuff right here. Alright, so Jarvis has Preordain and Delver of Secrets. So notice that Aaron Relentless decided to just go for the removal spell on the Delver right now. So why is that? By doing it on their turn, he does successfully play around Force of Negation. The Daze there kind of sucks, but the Daze is likely to hit some relevant spell at one point of this game or another, more or less, no matter what. So by casting the Swords to Plowshares on his opponent's turn and not playing around Daze, he successfully plays around Force of Negation, and makes it so they can actually cast the Stoneforge Mystic that's in hand. And notice that this is the card that got dazed, and not the initial removal spell on the Delver. Okay, now, now this is scary time. If Dreadhorde Arcanist goes unchecked, the game probably ends in a single turn cycle. Luckily, no removal spell here means that Sanctum Prelate resolves and just does work. Notice the rock solidness of triple planes on the mana base there, doing excellent, excellent work. And now all the one drops are shut off. He has a flicker wisp in play to start pressuring the opponent. The Oak O is off of the table for this turn cycle, unless Jarvis has another land. And now it's just going to be three damage a turn while Rashad and porting, or force the opponent to lose their wasteland. Okay, and this is a marvelous, marvelous draw. Alright, so let's play the Recruiter of the Guard game again. What are you getting, YouTubers? What do you get in this position? You have tons of options available to you. You can get a, a powerful 2-drop that you can play this turn, like Stoneforge Mystic or Thalia. You can get another Recruiter and just like ride the body train as hard as possible. You can get a Flicker Wisp to grab another recruiter target later, you can just grab Skyclave Apparition. What are you doing? He opts for Skyclave Apparition. Now, why is that? What is the card that threatens to break this game state? It is a non-one-drop removal spell. So that could be something like an Abrade, it could be something like an Oko, an Oko into Dreadheart Arcanus being unlocked and starting to take over this game is the scariest thing that can happen. So grabbing something that plays around that world makes a lot of sense. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not sure... What I think about putting the Skyclave Apparition into play. I know that he doesn't really have anything else to do with his turn, and so it's tempting to use mana. But if he were to draw a piece of equipment later, being able to answer that Null Rod and actually use the equipment is quite nice. Or if the opponent grabs Oko, which is one of the scariest things that can happen, Having the ability to just have this apparition to answer that is huge, huge game. So 
I don't know if I would have played that card this turn. It's really hard without being in the game and having a feel for the game, like whether or not that's correct. But this is one of those times where I looked at this play and I went, uh, what do I actually think about that? Now, the rationale for this play is probably if my opponent plays a removal spell on this creature, I want them to only be able to attack with one Dreadheart Arcanist, not two. And I, I totally get that. The disaster case scenario from here is something like a braid on Sanctum Prelate followed by Lightning Bolt on Skyclave Apparition. That's one of the sorts of things that could lead to this game being over. So I think taking one of them off the board is justifiable so that they don't get to attack in and like ponder and Lightning Bolt in the same turn cycle or something like that. All right, so we see a Wasteland on the land here, and that means that something like Oko is off the table. And notice here that he is just holding back this Swords to Plowshares. Uh, no need to cast this here. You can go ahead and cast it, put the opponent at 5, and then go ahead and finish things off that way. But the Arcanist isn't really threatening anything right now, and maybe some weird flash creature could or something like that. And just like that, that becomes the end of this event, and Aaron Relentless takes down this tournament. <laughs> Highlighting the Sanctum Prelate here at the end in a little gesture of like, this is what won me this match. Alright folks, I hope you enjoyed this content, and I do want to thank Aaron Relentless for giving me permission to do commentary on his videos. These top 8 matches were amazing and really showed off the sorts of things that you need to be doing if you want to be a top tier Death and Taxes player. Um, this is a player who was fully focused on the event, no streaming, no recording, and this is what you can do when you're fully focused on the deck, not distracted by streaming or anything of that nature. And I have just the highest degree of praise for his skills and abilities here. Um, if you enjoyed this content, feel free to give him a shout on Twitter, at Aaron underscore Relentless. I'm sure he would appreciate hearing some kind words and wishes of congratulations on his success. If you enjoyed this content, please consider liking and or subscribing to the channel. If you aren't already subscribed, it helps to support me and my content and means more to me than you know. Have a great rest of the day, folks, and for those of you playing DNT, I hope this shows you that if you're playing well and you know what you should be doing, that you have a real chance at making it in today's meta, even if over the last couple of weeks results weren't necessarily great. I do also want to take a second to point out that the cost of cantrips was very high for some of the opponents in this league. Spirit of the Labyrinth, sorry, in this uh, showcase challenge, Spirit of the Labyrinth shut down Jarvis in that last round uh, in rather spectacular fashion, and it put the squeeze on other opponents as well. And when Jarvis took the time to cast a handful of cantrips in that final round, rather than just immediately deploying threats that were relevant and taking over the game, there was a very real cost to that in terms of tempo. So food for thought for the future. Have a great rest of the day.